Good morning. So glad that you are here, whether you're here in person or you're online, or maybe you're going to watch us later. But we are so happy that you're here to hear Pastor's uh, encouragement, his truths from the Word of God. But we're going to start out with seeing some praise and worship. We ask you to please join us, stand and, and sing with us if you'd like.
the river. We come alive in 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 the river. Praise God forevermore. I think we need to sing that song again. Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We 
come alive in the river. We come alive in the river. We come alive in the river. We come alive in the river. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Father God, that, Lord, we are planted by the rivers of water. Hallelujah. And it brings nourishment to us. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father God. Hallelujah. The rivers. Hallelujah. That we are planted by. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father God. That's your word. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We come alive, Father God, when we are near your word. We come alive where your spirit flows. Hallelujah. We praise you, Father God. We thank you, Lord God, that our life depends on it, Father God. Oh, praise your holy name. Yes, we are alive when we come close to you, when we come close to your word. Hallelujah. We praise you, Father God. We are planted. Hallelujah. By the rivers of water, the righteous. Hallelujah. Planted by the rivers of living water. Hallelujah. We praise you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We honor you, Father, this morning. We thank you. Hallelujah. Praise your holy name. We thank him this morning because we are planted. Like the Psalm 91, uh, Psalm, uh, uh, Psalm 1 says that we are planted by the rivers of water. Hallelujah. Praise you, Father. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We thank him for that. We thank him for that. Just that alone brings nourishment. It brings health and healing to us. Hallelujah. Just being planted in the right place. Hallelujah. Praise you, Father. We glorify you. We honor you, Father. Hallelujah. Yes, we are alive when we are close to you, when we are, when we are in your word, where we allow your Holy Spirit to move. Hallelujah. To have free course. Hallelujah. We are alive there. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father, for it. Hallelujah. Praise you, Father. Hallelujah. Glory be to your holy name. Thank you, Father. We honor you this morning. We thank you, Father God, for setting us free, setting the captive free. That's why Jesus went on the cross. He came to set the captives free, and we qualify. Hallelujah. We qualify. Hallelujah. We have been set free. Hallelujah. Praise you, Father. Thank you, Jesus, for, for reconciling us to the Father through your blood. We honor you, Father. We glorify you, Lord. Hallelujah. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Isn't that wonderful to be planted by the rivers of living water? Amen. Hallelujah. That's where we should be. Amen. That's where the nourishment is. It's like a tree. You know, it's like a tree that is planted by the river. The leaves are always green. Amen. Amen. The leaves never withers. Amen. Amen. And that's who we are. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Hallelujah. Having too much fun. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. Well, good morning to everyone. Good morning. Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. Thank you for coming out this morning. Uh, and uh, it's good to see your beautiful faces, people who are here and those online. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate you watching us week after week. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, it's a privilege, amen. amen? It's a privilege to belong to God, amen? amen? And you know what is an outstanding privilege? Is that we can be led by His Spirit, amen? We can be led by Holy Spirit. So my nugget this morning is in Romans 8, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 8, verse 14. And the King James, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Amen. That's a privilege that we can be led by the Spirit of God. And the Passion Translation says, The mature children of God are those who are moved by the impulses of Holy Spirit. You know, what is an impulse? An impulse is a sudden strong desire to act or a driving or motivating force. You know, God knew that we needed Holy Spirit to live this life. Right? 
He, we know that if we are going to be effective Christians, we need the leading of Holy Spirit. You know, a good example of that is in uh, Acts chapter 16, verse 17. You know, when uh, Paul and Silas, they were going uh, to the temple. I believe they were going to church to, uh, to pray, you know. They were going to church to pray, and there was this girl who was behind them, who was causing destruction. You know, she was, uh, you know, she was behind them. I think it, it went on for a few, uh, few days. She was behind them, and she was saying, yeah, these, these men are men of God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. She was causing destruction, but thank God that Paul was, led, was following the leading of Holy Spirit. He was not, he didn't respond right away. Paul was a mature believer, and he was following the leading of Holy Spirit. And like I said, this was going on for a few days until the day that Holy Spirit showed him how, what to do. So it is so important that we follow the leading of Holy Spirit. And you know what happened? Uh, after a few days, Holy Spirit led him to the answer. He casted that evil spirit because the, she was saying the right things. You know, don't get me wrong. She was saying the right things, but he was under a different spirit. Amen. It was not under the spirit of God. So Paul was able to properly uh, uh, discern what was going on, that she was actually causing destruction. So then he was able to cast the spirit out of the girl. And when she did that, well, it caused some people to be upset. It caused the devil to be upset, but that's a different story, <laughs> right? But Paul led, uh, God, uh, the Holy Spirit led Paul to deal with that situation uh, properly so that she was no longer a distraction. So my point is, Holy Spirit leading is very subjective. You know, sometimes, you know, you might be facing a difficulty or a problem. You know, that might be going on for a few days. Right? So sometimes we, we deal with things like this is keep, it keeps staring at my face. What do I do with this? But thank God that because we have chosen to, to grow in God, to be mature in God, we can, we can follow the leading of Holy Spirit. Amen. And like Paul did, Paul, Paul followed the leading of Holy Spirit. And the same with us, we have the opportunity to be led by Holy Spirit every day of our life to find answers and solutions to things that we, we, we face. Um, and every situation is different, but Holy Spirit will lead us to the right answer every time. You know, sometimes, you know, you read the word or we come in here, everything is so black and white. It's like, if this happened, this is how Holy Spirit is, has led so-and-so, and I'm just going to take it and plug it in my situation. You know, it doesn't happen all the time that way. Right? You have to, the Holy Spirit leading is very subjective. He's going to show you exactly what to do uh, about your situation. Yeah, everything is so black and white, but then when we get out in the real world, it's very gray. It's a gray zone. And that's where we need the Holy Spirit to lead us to get to the right answer. Amen? So Holy Spirit is an expert in the gray zone, in the gray area of our life. Amen? So let's uh, cover that... Uh, following after the Spirit, being led by the Spirit. Amen? So that is for our benefits, and it's one of the privileges. If we choose to be mature believers, if we choose to follow after God hard. Amen? So that's my encouragement for you this morning. Let the Holy Spirit lead you in everything that you do. He has the best answers. He can help you in anything. Amen? So let's be mature believers and follow the leading of Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. I know it's a little bit sometimes over our head, but, you know, I know we all face gray area in our lives, and we don't know what to do, but Holy Spirit knows. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. Well, let's uh, switch to our morning tithes and offering. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. God loves a cheerful giver. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, uh, uh, so you have your envelope. Please feel free to use your envelope and uh, and fill it out completely. Text your giving to the number on your screen or just mail your check to us. Hallelujah. Oh, I got it written here. Uh, our giving scripture this morning is in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 16. From the God's Word translation, it says, A gift open, opens door for the one who gives it. It's not the one who takes. And brings him 
into the presence of great people. Let me read that again. A gift opens door for the one who gives it and brings him into the presence of great people. And our giving is what opened doors of, uh, doors of favor for us, doors of promotion. Amen. Our healing is attached to it. Our peace is attached to our giving. Amen. And because God has designed it that way, and that whenever the Bible says in uh, uh, Matthew 6.33, that if we put the kingdom of God first and his righteousness, everything else will be added unto us. Amen. And it's never a waste whenever we put the kingdom of God first. Whenever we give, it's never a waste. Uh, I was listening to Jerry Savelle's daughter, uh, Terry Savelle. She said she, you know, she looks for favor wherever she goes. She looks for favor, and she was at the airport and uh, going somewhere, and her luggages were overweight. And the, the, the person checking her in is like, your luggage is just way over, over you know, it's over the, the way limit. But thank God that, you know, because she's, she always looked for favor, they just let her check it in without any, you know, not even paying, you know, what she was supposed to pay. So that's the favor of God, right? Things that we don't even work for, right? So when we give, the gift that we give, open doors of favor, of promotion for us. Amen? Even like I, myself, I told you before that, you know, when I was giving, it was difficult. But then God opened doors for me. I got a scholarship. Amen? I, and uh, things that I was not even looking God always brings it to us, amen? Because God always does exceedingly, abundantly above, beyond what we think or ask, amen? amen. So be blessed. When you give, know that your gift is what's going to open doors for you. And never come into the presence of God and, 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 and think that whatever you are giving is not going to cause a promotion or cause breakthrough for you. It will do something, amen? amen. So if you are ready, uh, let's... Uh, Lift up our offering and read our scripture. Sean, if you can put the scripture up for us. Hallelujah. If you are ready, just read it with me. As I tithe and give offerings, I am believing the Lord for souls and more souls, 100-fold return, jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interests and income, rebates and returns, discounts and dividends, royalties, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills decrease, bills paid off, Jubilee's church mortgage paid off, blessings and increase. Thank you, Lord, for supplying all of my financial needs that I have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Welcome to Jubilee Church, where we're transforming lives impacting our community so that we can live a better life. We're glad you're here today to worship with us. If you're a new visitor, the ushers should have given you a pamphlet to write your name and contact information in so that we can keep in touch with you. If you did not receive a pamphlet, please raise your hand now and an usher will be glad to bring you one. Upon leaving the service today, we also have a special gift for you to show our appreciation that you have chosen to worship with us today. Our service times are Sunday morning at 10 a.m. and Wednesday evenings at 6.30 p.m. Prayer time with Pastor Anthony is on Tuesdays at 10 a.m. Youth group is on the first and third Friday at 6 p.m. and is online only. Bible study is on Wednesday evenings at 6.30 p.m. Travel Through the Bible is our current Bible study, which starts in Genesis and continues through Revelation. When we wake up tomorrow, what, what is the world going to be like? When we wake what about next week? What about my children? What kind of world is my children going to grow up in? All this stuff is gripping the world. This book is full, full of information. 
no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And the same God that raised Lazarus from the dead, the same God that raised Jesus from the dead, the same God that did it time and time again, he's the same daddy that says, I'll never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. I've been there since day one. I was there in your losses, but I've been there in your victories. And I got news for you. You're about to have another victory. Somebody stand to your feet and give God a shout of praise. Enjoy the rest of the service. We're glad you're here. Stand. We're going to sing one last song talking about how good God is to us and how his goodness follows after us. We thank you, Lord.
of the goodness of God. Oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness towards us. Lord, we are forever grateful that you are faithful to your word. You watch over your word to perform it. And Lord, we are forever grateful. And Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We honor you for your faithfulness. And Lord, we say you've been good. And Father, you've never let us down. And for all that we have been living in life, we can declare that you are faithful. We can testify of your goodness and of your mercy that are new to us every single day. Oh Lord, we bless your name. Father, we praise you this morning. Can we just lift up our voices and praise him for his faithfulness? Lord, you've been faithful to our lives. You've been faithful to our families. You've been faithful to our community. You've been faithful for the Lord to show yourself strong on our behalf. And Lord, we lift up our voices unto you this morning and say, Lord, you've been faithful. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, glorious Lord, glorious Lord, glorious Lord. Father, we bring our praises unto you this morning and declare of your goodness and of your faithfulness towards our lives. Oh, we bless you, Lord, and we praise you, Father, and we magnify your name because you're good. Hallelujah. 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 And indeed, Lord, you have been good. Every single day of our lives, Lord, you've led us. For you've declared that, Lord, the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. And so, Lord, you've been faithful to order our steps. And Father, we thank you that you've been faithful to bless the works of our hands. And Lord, we thank you that you've been faithful to protect us in our dwelling places. And Lord, we give you glory, we give you praise. This morning, Lord, I thank you for ministering to us. Those who are watching online, those who are present in this place, Lord, we thank you for speaking to us. You have been forever faithful. You are faithful to speak to us. And Lord, we thank you as we ask you this morning to open our eyes and see the things that you have prepared for us. We ask you, Lord, to open our ears to hear as you speak to us. And Lord, we thank you that our hearts can receive the things that you've already given to us. We praise you and we honor you for the presence of the Holy Spirit that is in this place. And Holy Spirit, we thank you for being our helper. And as you guide and lead us and show us the things that God has prepared for us, we will forever continue to give you praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. It's good to see each and every one of you. For the Lord has been good and God has been faithful. Amen. And anybody testify of God's faithfulness in your life. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Say this with me. For the Lord is good. And his mercies endure us forever. For the Lord is good. And his mercies endure us forever. For the Lord is good. And his mercies endure us forever. Amen. So you should be believing that all the time. Speaking that all the time. Because God is faithful. Amen. And God is good. Now your life... The life that you live as a believer is impossible without the help of the Holy Spirit. You can do everything you know how to do. You can sing, you can dance, you can shout. But if you don't engage the Holy Spirit, it is impossible for you to live the life that you're living without the help of the Holy Spirit. And so I'd like to encourage you every single day, like MF has encouraged us today, engage the Holy Spirit in your life. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you because you'll realize that there are some things that are not in Scripture that you need guidance in. The Bible doesn't say specifically 
which place you need to work. The Bible does not say specifically where you need to live. The Bible does not say specifically how to be able to find the place that you need to go purchase your vehicle in. But you need guidance. And the guidance of the Holy Spirit will lead you. Because the Bible says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. In other words, the sons of God should expect to be led by the Spirit of God. And He will lead you to the very exact thing that you really need to know. Why? Because He is so much involved into your very details of your life. And so today, I thank God that we can be led by the Spirit. And in order for us to be led by the Spirit, you need to develop what we call perseverance or endurance in your life. Because if you've not realized it yet, there are some things that take a while for them to take place. And uh, if you read the Bible, you realize that there are things that actually entail or involve man if they're going to take place in your life. The only thing that does not involve man is actually healing. Healing does not involve man. Healing involves you and God. But when it comes to believing God for finances or believing God for something like that, it involves man because a man has to obey the voice of God to do what God has already uh, prepared for you. So if you need some finances and you're believing God for it, you know God is not going to rain up uh, money from heaven. <laughs> you can look up unto the heavens expecting money to rain from heavens and you won't find none. But you know what? There is somebody whom God has spoken to to be able to be a blessing to you. Amen. And so it causes you to be able to endure, stand in and, and, and pray that the person who has that money to bring them your way. And so it involves men for that to take place. And so you have to learn to develop endurance in the Lord. Because the Bible says, for you have need of endurance, for after you've done the will of God, you may obtain the promises of God. That's in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 36. You have need of endurance. After you've done the will of God, you may obtain the promises of God. In other words, you keep on standing on the word of God and don't give up because the promise is about to happen. Amen? And so, I'd like to encourage you this morning. Uh, I'd like to encourage you uh, about or remind you that this coming Sunday, we'll be having uh, Reverend Phil with us. And uh, he's going to be with us in the morning service and in the evening service, 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. I'd like to encourage you uh, to make arrangements and be here Sunday, next Sunday in the morning and the evening, and invite your friends, invite your neighbors, and, and come and be blessed by the Word of God. Amen? You want to be part of what God is doing uh, in our lives because this is for us. This is not for any one particular individual. This is for us as a church, Jubilee Church. I'd like to encourage you to be able to be involved in that. Amen? And uh, with that said, I think it's time to hear the Word. Amen? Are you ready to receive the word of God? Or are you satisfied already? <laughs> or have you heard the word already? And you don't want to hear it anymore? Now the Bible says faith comes by hearing and by hearing the word of God. In other words, if there is something you need to be hungry for, it's the word of God. You can never get enough of the word of God. If you say you've got enough of the word of God, you've already been deceived. And the Bible says do not be deceived. Because if you're deceived, there's nobody who can help you, even God himself can't help you. So you always have to stay hungry. I'm hungry for the word of God. I can be hungry for, I can be satisfied for the food. I can be satisfied for sleeping, but I can never be satisfied with the word of God. I want to hear the word consistently and constantly. Amen. And so last week, I was sharing from 1 Peter chapter 5. And I would like to pick up from there. I never finished it, so I want to pick up from there and continue. Because you've got to realize that every single day you have questions. And every single day you're going to be challenged. But you've got to learn how to overcome every challenge that comes your way. And especially when you're a believer, you're going to face more challenges than an unbeliever just because of your new identity. Because your new identity identifies you as a child of God. And being a child of God, it means now you have access to the power of God. And you have access to your mind being renewed. And you have access to walk and live in the life of God. And therefore, you are no longer under the authority of the devil. 
But the person who is not born again is still under the influence of the devil because the Bible says Satan is the god of this world and he is out about seeking whom he may devour by blinding the minds of their understanding so that they do not, under, uh, so that they do not see the light of the glorious gospel. But we who have been born again, who have received the Lord Jesus Christ, the entrance of his word always brings light to us. Amen. So in other words, we are always enlightened. And therefore the enemy works over time to make sure that if he can have an opportunity, he can blind the minds of your understanding. That which you have received, can he take it away from you? But you have to stand and say, no, there is no way you're going to take it away from me because I have chosen to stand in the truth. I have chosen to believe that which God has given to me and it is mine and I lay hold of it and I make it my very own. Amen. And therefore we have to choose to stand and be able to stand our ground. So in 1 Peter chapter 5, I ask you to, start, to turn over there and I'm not there, so, but I am there now. And we'll begin in verses 8, but before I start in verses 8, I'll just start in verses 6. It says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. In other words, for us believers, if you're going to be exalted, now I started earlier than wherever I said you're going to go. I said you're going to start in verses 8, but I've started in verses 6. So when you're looking over there and you're seeing something different, I'm the one who just made that decision now. So don't be surprised. He said, therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that, you may be, that he may exalt you in due time. So as a believer, if you want promotion, you have to humble yourself. In the world, you don't have to humble yourself to be promoted. You've got to do everything. You've got to push people aside. You've got to cheat sometimes in the world to, in order for you to be promoted. But for believers, we don't have to do that. God said, just humble yourself. To humble yourself simply means to submit yourself to God. In other words, yield yourself to God. And as you yield yourself to God, he says he will exalt you in due time. When is the due time? It is a time of promotion. The time of promotion is the due time. God says he'll exalt you in due time. So the due time is the time that you need the promotion. And God says, when you yield yourself to me, I will promote you in your time. When is that time? Well, we just sang today about the river. There's a river that is flowing. And the Bible says that wherever that river goes, there is life and there is healing. And then the Bible says that we shall be like trees planted by the rivers whose leaves will never wither, but will be able to produce in its season, which means every season is a season of, is a season of productivity. And so when God exalts you, he exalts you in every season of your life. All you've got to do is you've got to submit yourself to him. You've got to yield yourself to God. And you know what? So many times people think that submission is a bad thing. Submission is not a bad thing. See, whoever is smart and wise will submit. But whoever is not wise will not submit. Because in you submitting to God you are actually allowing God to be Lord over your life. You are saying, I, I allow you to be Lord over my life. Lead me in this area. I thought I knew, but I want you to help me so that I may know that I know. And you know, whatever you thought that you knew, you'll be surprised to realize you knew very little of what you thought you knew. And so the Bible says, humble yourself under the, uh, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time Casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. In other words, while you are yielding yourself to God, submitting yourself to God, you're going to have cares. You care about your health. You care about your children. You care about your family. You care about your children, your finances. You care about your place of worship. You care about your car. You care about your work. But he says, you know what? While you're submitting to me, allowing me to be your Lord, then now... Let me take care of all your cares. Because when you hold on to your cares, you will not be able to yield yourself to me. You will miss me with your cares. But when you cast your cares upon me, then I will be able to help you in your submission to me. And so with those cares, you've got to understand that the cares of this life are going to distract you 
from you being productive in your, in your spiritual life. Being told, uh, we've read about the, the parable of the sower, and we hear about the seed that fell among the thorns. And the Bible says that this is him who receives the word of God, but the cares of this life chokes up the word. In other words, the word is supposed to bring life. The Bible says, my word that I speak to you, they are life and they are spirit. They are giving you spirit life. But the cares of this life choke that up, choke the spirit life in you. Therefore, you are suffocating as a child of God. Instead of you living, you are suffocating. So you're just finding anything you can have. Can you pray for me? Can you help me out? Can you, can you lay your hands on me? Can you do this? Can you do that? So you're just surviving and suffocating everywhere. Why? Because you are holding on to the cares of life and they're choking you up and cutting off the flow of God's life into your hands. And God says, no, cast your cares upon me for I care for you. Why? When you cast them all upon the Lord, guess what? You have opened an avenue where the life of God is now bringing life in you, and now you can live the life of God. And therefore, in verses 8, he says, after casting all your cares upon the Lord, because, you know, sometimes we cast our cares upon the Lord, and then what do we do? We take it back. <laughs> God, I trust you with my children. I really trust you with my children. And then you see them, doing something that you had already instructed them not to do, and then you go back and take it again and say, well, what did I tell you? They're like, no, cast it upon the Lord for he cares upon you. Because, you know, sometimes when you've cast your cares upon the Lord, you don't see the immediate effect, but it is working. And so he says, once you've done that, now we get to verses 8. Be sober. <laughs> Be sober, be self-controlled. And we talked about being sober last week. You need to be self-controlled. And actually being self-controlled is actually as a result of your spirit being in control. Because in Galatians chapter 5 verses 23, we understood that the fruit of the spirit is love that is expressed in various ways. The fruit of the spirit, and also the fruits of the spirit, said the fruit of the spirit is love, then joy, patience. So it's, it's expressed, love is expressed in joy, it is expressed in patience, it is expressed in meekness, it is expressed in gentleness, it is expressed in self-control. And so therefore, you're being told, be self-controlled. In other words, allow your spirit to be in charge now because you are a new species. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. In other words, your spirit man is a new man. And you're being told, let the new man be in control. If your new man is in control, then things are going to be better for you. But if the new man is not in control, things won't be better for you. So we are being reminded, be sober. Why? If you are sober, it's going to help you. You're going to be strong when you're in control. But if you're not in control, you will not be strong. So be strong and be vigilant. And now, if you're going to be strong and vigilant, to be vigilant simply means to be watchful or to be aware. One who is alert, you've got to understand that this implies your spirit man. You need to be in control and you need to be alert spiritually. If you're not in control spiritually and not alert spiritually, then you're going to miss some spiritual things. And that's why we have to engage the Holy Spirit. Because when we engage the Holy Spirit, the Bible says the Spirit bears witness with our spirit. And as He bears witness with our spirit, He bears witness that we are the children of God. In other words, we have to understand who we really are as a spiritual man as a spiritual being. Because if you don't understand who you are spiritually, then it is very much possible for you not to be led by the Spirit of God. And so I'd like to encourage you today, know who you are if you're going to be sober and be alert. Know who you are. The Bible says, I am redeemed. So you are redeemed by the blood of Jesus from every curse of the law. In other words, sin brought a curse. But because of the blood of Jesus, you've been redeemed from that. So now you have to be strong in that. Know who you are. 
In other words, I'm going to be strong in that and I'm going to be alert about that. Anything that is going to tell me you are a sinner, I'm going to oppose, I'm going to oppose that. How many have ever found a believer saying, I'm a sinner? See, you're not strong. You're not sober. You're not alert on who you are. Because if you are alert or you are sober, you are self-controlled, you'll understand that I was a sinner, but I'm no longer a sinner. And if I'm no longer a sinner, then I will not think like a sinner and I'll not act like a sinner. But if I'm not sober, self-control in me being a spirit man who's been born again, who's been made near with God, who understands that in him I live and move and have my being, who understands that the life of God res resonates within me, then I can simply say, I'm a sinner. So who is the sinner? <laughs> if you are born again, you are a sinner. But if you keep on saying you are a sinner, then you see you've already been defeated by the devil. He's already blinded your mind so that you do not understand the truth of the gospel. And once you do not understand the truth of the gospel, guess what? You cannot yield to the spirit of God. You cannot submit to God. Why? Because you still see yourself as a sinner. But God sees you as his righteous. But you see yourself as a sinner. So how can you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and him being able to lead and control you? And not actually control you, guide you. So we have to be sober. We have to be alert. And as we are alert, then we are well able to be aware of our spiritual environment. Now, once you are sober, once you are alert, he says, be sober, be vigilant. And you're told why? Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So you understand you have an adversary. And like I mentioned last week, the word adversary is actually a legal term. And that adversary is a legal term of one who is against your rights, which means you do have a right as a child of God. And if you do have a right as a child of God, there is one who is against your rights. And that person who is against your right, he has some kind of behavior that will be able to trick you not to live for your rights. And then he describes how this individual operates by giving him a name called the devil. The devil is not his actual name. The devil is, is his character. One who slanders. He likes to slander. And that word, if you look at it more closely in Greek, it says one who ponders the same path, throwing over it. In other words, if there is a path that has never been set, like on your backyard, and you keep on walking on the same, same path over and over and over, pretty soon there's going to be a path over there. Why? Because you've walked over it over and over and over and over. And therefore, your adversary likes to ponder things over and over and over and over and over and over and over. If you give him an opportunity, then there's going to be a path in that avenue in your life where you'll not be able to stand strong. So you're being told, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. Now, you've got to understand that he has a problem with you and not an unbeliever. Why? Because you have the capability of stopping him from doing what he wants to do. An unbeliever can never stop him because they are still under his influence. And that's why the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12 that you do have an accuser of the brethren. You see, the Bible says he accuses the brethren. He does not uh, accuse the world. He accuses the brethren. Why? Because the brethren have got the capacity to stop him from doing what he wants to do. And therefore, you have to understand that I have the capacity to be able to stop him. Never be afraid of the devil. Because the devil has got no authority. He has already been defeated. Yeah. If I can just help you understand that, the devil is not bigger than you. Sure. If you want to know how strong you are, just read the Bible and hear about that madman that Jesus and his disciples were going to the other side when they say, let us go over to the other side. And then he was, man, he was met by this madman in Gadara. And when he met this man, the spirit was speaking through this man and Jesus asked him, who are you? And he said, I am a legion, for we are many. And he says, 
when he cast out the demons, they went into over 2,000 pigs, right? You see the capacity that you have as an individual. That 2,000 demons were in this man. Now you have the Lord Jesus Christ in you. You have a greater capacity that not even a thousand demons can manage you. Amen. Your capacity is very much greater that even if 10,000 demons come up and say we are going to overpower you, you just laugh. Because greater is he that is in me Amen. than he that is in the world. So never be afraid of the devil. He can do nothing to you unless you give him permission. And there is no way I'll ever give him permission to do that. Amen. And therefore, we have to constantly renew our minds to the word of God. Why? Because your mind has not come to the revelation of what your spirit is. Right. And therefore, you have to allow the word of God to constantly come through your mind. And as your, the word is coming through your mind, it's renewing your mind. The Bible says the entrance of his word gives forth light. In other words, I'm enlightened in the eyes of my understanding and I begin now to agree with my spirit because Holy Spirit is bearing witness with my spirit, but it is my mind that is actually a hindrance and saying, no, 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 no. You can't be that nice because there's nobody who's nice. And then you say, yeah, we are just sinners. No, we are not just sinners. I am not just nice. I have the good one inside of me. He's the one who makes me good. Without him, I can't be good. That's why the Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Yes. See, they are good works because God is good and is inside of you. And because God is good and is inside of you, and when you yield yourself to him and you're being led by the Spirit of God, all I can do is do good things. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with the power who went about doing good. See, when you're a child of God and you're anointed by the Holy Ghost, you go about doing good. Are you good? I'm not good. But I know him who is inside of me, who is helping me be good. And therefore, I'm no longer a sinner. Well, I won't say that because what if you fall into sin? Well, God has made provision for that. He says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. In other words, he's saying, yes, your human body might sometimes cause you to miss me, but if you find out that you've missed me, immediately come back in because this is a legal system. Your adversary is against your right, and he wants to drive over your, over your thinking to the point whereby you lose your place of rightness with him. And so we are told to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, seeks him whom he may devour. Now you've got to understand that the, uh, the word walks there. It simply means the way of living or progress or to conduct oneself. So he's saying that your adversary has a way of living, has a way of progress. And this way of living and this way of progress is operating as a lion so that he may devour you. So he has a way and this way doesn't change. It's the same. Do you know that the devil can't make anything? He has no power to make anything. He has never made anything and he will never make anything. And that's why Paul is also telling us that do not be ignorant of the schemes of the devil. In other words, he is well strategized. He is well planned. But if you are alert spiritually, if you are sober and you are vigilant, then those schemes will never work for you or work against you. Because those schemes are simply traps. But you know what? As long as you walk with God, God was there before the beginning. In, in other words, before your adversary was there, God was there. And in your adversary being here right now does not mean that he's smarter than God. God says, I just know every plan that he has. And if you stay with me, I will help you. So he says he walks like a roaring lion, walks about seeking. The word there, seek, simply means to demand something. So he's demanding whom he may devour. You remember very well Jesus, right before he was cruc crucified, he told Peter that Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to sift you. And actually the word desired there is demand. And actually it's the amplified translation that actually brings it out that Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat. 
So in other words, his demand is, I'm going to be persistent on this, and as I'm persistent on this, my demand is, will you allow me to devour you? Will you allow me to devour you? He doesn't go to God and say, God, I'm demanding of you right now. I want her. No, God can never do that, and he can never do that. The devil can never do that anyway. He's been sent out from heaven. And so, what he's going to do is constantly throw things in your mind. Constantly throw things in your mind. Putting a demand on that. You are not good enough. You can never make it. You are going to suffer. You are going to die. You are going to be sick. Constantly putting that pressure in your mind. Demanding for you to step out of your position of life. But if you're going to be sober, you're going to be vigilant, then he cannot devour you. Now, the word devour there simply means to pull you down from your position of nourishment or to pull you down from your place of life. Therefore, when you have been raised up together with Christ and you've been made to sit together in heavenly places, you are in a place of life, you are in a place of authority, you are in a place of joy, you are in a place of peace, but the devil wants to try and bring you down from that place. Why? He can never attack you in that high place. Because the Bible says you've been raised up together with him far above every principalities and every power. And therefore, if you've been raised far above from him, he has to bring you down in order for him to walk over you. Because the Bible says that he's out to steal, kill, and to destroy. He can never steal from you. He can never destroy from you. And he can never kill from you unless you come down from your place of authority. And therefore, never allow him to be able to to demand you to get out of your position of life so that he might devour you. Now, if you're going to be alert and you're going to be sober, self-control, and you're alert, how are you going to overcome him? The next verse tells us how. Resist him. Which means you have the capacity to resist. If you never had the capacity to resist, you'll never be told to resist. You are resisting because you are able, you have the capability to resist. You're told to resist him. How am I going to resist him? Steadfast in faith. To be steadfast means to be able to endure in faith. Stand in faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. In other words, you find out what the word of God says and be persistent and consistent on that word of God. And as long as you stand on that word of God, guess what? He has to flee. Because that is the only way you are going to be able to overcome him. Because that's what Jesus did in the book of Luke and Matthew, Matthew chapter 4. When the devil showed up, was trying to bring Jesus from, down from his position of authority. And says, if you are the son of God, why don't you turn these stones into lo loaves of bread? Jesus resisted him in steadfast in faith by saying, it is written. You have to tell him what is written. Because that is what has kept you. You have to know what is written. If you don't know what is written, then you are a good candidate for him to devour you. And therefore, you have to know what is written. You have to remind yourself of what is written. Don't say, oh, I read it last week. I, I, I know that verse. No, remind me, remind me. You know what, what that verse is? No, no, no. You keep yourself in the word. When you keep yourself in the word, when he tries to show up, because he goes around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. When he shows up in your house and say, hey, you know what? You've been sniffling lately. Maybe you're going to catch a, a flu. At that particular time, you have a right to answer that. Because if you don't answer that, he's going to come again and say, you know what? You're kind of like feeling a little bit tired. And then you sniff your nose and you're feeling tired. And maybe you need to go get some rest. And then maybe now you have fever. And these things begin to go on in your mind and go on in your mind and go on in your mind and go on in your mind. And guess what? You're going to have a fever and you're going to have a cold. Did you ever realize how much your mind can hold you in bondage? I was reading last week about... Uh, some doctors were doing some tests. And so when they were doing some tests, they got two groups of people, and one group was given a placebo, a sugar pill. And one group was given the real medication for the test that they're doing to see what the outcome is going to be. And so one individual who was in the group of placebo really believed that whatever he's been taking is what has been making him sleep at night. 
And so when he ran out of it, he told the doctor, I just took my last one and I need the next one. And the doctor said, we can give you another one. He said that, no, if you don't give it to me, I cannot sleep. So he was told, okay, you go, since you've never slept without one, go and then see what's going to happen. So that night, he did not sleep because he never had his pill. So the following day, he called back the doctor's office and said, I did not sleep last night. I was awake all night. I could not sleep because I did not get the pill. And so the doctor told him that, uh, I'm sorry, we can't give you that pill. He said, I need it. And so he drove himself to the clinic and demanded that he needed that medication because he won't sleep if he does not get it. <clears throat> so finally, the doctor had to come and tell him, let me tell you the truth. We have been giving you a sugar pill. It is not the right medication. It is a sugar pill that you've been taking. And so when the doctor convinced him, he went and slept. So you ask yourself, look at how the mind played the tricks on this individual to the effect that he could not sleep, believing that that pill is what made him sleep. It is the very same way the devil can begin to talk your mind into something and you find yourself doing that. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was changing an air filter in the house. And this air filter, most of them are usually white. But I happened to have put on a gray one and will not remember that I put on a gray one. So when I pulled it out, <laughs> I was a little bit caught off guard and say, wow, we must be dusty in this house. <laughs> it's gray, like all this is dirt. It's, it's usually white. And so I went to MF and said, do we usually put a white one or a gray one? I say, it's usually white. And I'm like, you want to tell me that within this few months, this house has been this dusty? And so I think it was Angelo and Annalise who had the, the allergy and was rubbing their nose. I said, that's why I've been rubbing my nose. <laughs> <laughs> and immediately it started playing tricks in our minds. That, that's why the other night I couldn't sleep because I was sneezing. And so it just went on and on just because of this one filter that we took out. And then I said, wait a minute. I can tear off the box and see what color it was. And it was gray. Then I said, oh, no. Look, it was gray. Then all of a sudden, all the, sneez the sneezings disappeared. <laughs> and you see how the mind can play a trick on you. And so we are told we have to be sober and we have to be vigilant and we have to resist the devil steadfast in faith. Because if you don't stand in the word of God, guess what? Your mind immediately will go into a place it does not need to go into. <laughs> and it was that funny that day. I'm like, no, all of a sudden, <laughs> all this sneeze, sneezing and sniffs have, have disappeared because you just say, oh, it was gray. Then in a matter of five minutes, it was white. The night is gray and it disappeared. So you can have a self-inflicted situation in your life just by what you're thinking. But if you're a lot and you're self-control, you won't go there. You won't go there. And so we are being told, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Which means whatever you're going through is not new. So don't let the devil convince you that you are the only one whom people don't like. Jesus already told you, a servant is not greater than the master. They don't like me. And so don't believe that you are the only one. No, I'm not the only one. I'm amongst those who are not liked. Why? Because of my stand in the Lord. But if they know who I really believe and what I stand for, they will love me. And so I always say, I don't have enemies. If someone says you're my enemy, I say, you're not my enemy. You just, know, you just don't know who I am. Because if you know who I am, you will be my friend. <laughs> and so we are told to be able to resist the devil steadfast in the faith. Now we understand that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. In other words, when you get into the word of God, you begin to understand who you are. You begin to understand what you have. And you begin to understand what you can do. If you understand who you are, what you have, and what you can do, then you're going to be alert. And once you're alert, then the enemy can never pull you down from your place of authority and devour you. Amen. And therefore, I'd like to be able to uh, share with you this morning. Now you have to begin to watch your mouth. Because if you don't watch your mouth, 
Your mouth will help you get out of place into the devil's place. And that is a place that many believers have not really come to the revelation, know, uh, the revelation knowledge of knowing who they really are and what they really have and what they can do. You understand that through your mouth, you speak what you believe. Because the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, whatever you believe in your heart, that is what you're going to speak. But if you're a child of God, you understand that you are a spiritual being. And if you're a spiritual being, then the spiritual being is one who is in control. And if the spiritual being is one who is in control, then my mind is renewed with the word of God. And out of the abundance of my heart, my mouth will speak because now my mind and my spirit are in unity. But if my mind and my spirit are not in unity, guess what? I will say something else that is not there. And therefore, I begin to declare every single day whose I am. I am a child of God. I've been born of the Spirit of God. And whoever is born of the Spirit of God overcomes the world. When I walk into the world, the world tries to throw its challenges at me. But I know that I will overcome because I've been born of the Spirit of God. And I've been born of God. And I overcome the world system. Never buy into the system of the world putting you down. Things do change if you're willing to work with the Holy Spirit. And I usually encourage the people who talk to me. Sometimes people tell me that, Pastor, you don't understand how things are happening. I'm reminded a uh, few years ago when we were buying the house that we are in right now. Uh, we had prayed and our desire was to get a house that we really like before we put our house in market, because if we put our house in market and sell it, then we might be without a house if we've not found one. And so according to the world system, it is good for you to sell your house before you buy one. That is how the worlds work. And so our realtor told us, this is the right thing for you to do. You need to put your house in market and let it be sold. And actually when you put your house in market, you can be looking so that we, we can negotiate in between while you're looking for the other one. I said that, no, that's not what we want to do. We want to find our house first, and we want to make an, an offer, and then we'll come to our house. Well, we were being led by the Spirit. We were going, that was, that was what was within our heart. That was what was within our spirit, which means the world system says one way, but within our hearts, within our spirit, it was something different. And if you're going to be led by the Spirit, then we have to yield ourselves to the Spirit of God and totally allow Him to guide us. And so we looked for a house and we found a house and we made an offer to our house. Yet we had not sold the other one. So they really just say that, you know what, this is impossible. I don't know how this will happen. I don't know how this will work. But we had inside information that he did not have. And so we are not going to argue with him. We are not going to just do what you need to do. We will do what we know how to do. And so in doing that, we were able to sell the house that we were in and buy this house without any kind of delay. Ours was bought even before it was put on market. We never put it in market anyway. Because when you're going to walk with God, God is going to do far beyond what you think and speak according to the power that is at work in your heart. And so the world system will put limits on you, but you've got to understand you do not operate under the world system. You operate under the heavenly system. What is the Holy Spirit telling you in your heart? That is what you go by more than what you see in the world. Yes, I understand that the world does that. I'm not refusing that. I'm not denying that. Because if I'm going to walk in faith, I'm not going to deny the reality. Because the Bible says that this is the victory that overcomes the world, not denies the world, it overcomes. In other words, I acknowledge that it is a reality, but I'm going to overcome that hurdle. Why? Because I am born of God, and whoever is born of God, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even my faith in Him. Therefore, I'm going to stand in faith because my faith gives me victory. Amen. And so, when the enemy tried to throw things in your brain... And in your mind, trying to think that, oh, there's no way this is going to happen. There's no way this shall ever happen. No, 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 no. It's going to happen because I know him whom I believe. And therefore, I know who I am. I know what I have and I know what I can do in him. And therefore, I'll keep myself strong in the word. And if I keep myself strong in the word, guess what? I am resisting the enemy. He has no opportunity to throw anything at me to stick. 
Because my shield of faith is up. And when my shield of faith is up, it's going to quench every fiery dart. And you know those fiery darts do come up. If you let your kids go, you don't know whom they're going to meet. You don't know what's going to happen out over there. Put your shield of faith and say, I have taught my children. For the Bible says, your children shall be taught of God and great shall be their peace and undisturbed composure. You go hide and rejoice because you know what? You have done what God has asked you to do. And the Bible says you have need of endurance. After you've done the will of God, you'll obtain the promises of God. I've already done the will of God. I'm just going to endure and say, you know what? My children are taught of God and great shall be their peace and undisturbed composure. Whatever the soul of their feet turns upon shall be their inheritance. And the spirit of God is leading them because the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. So Mr. Devil, you listen to me. I'm going to stay by faith because this is the victory that overcomes the world. Even my faith. And the Bible says it is impossible to please God without faith. And therefore, when I stand in faith, God is fighting my battle and I win and you lose. So we choose to stand on that and I don't allow any thought to come to my mind and say, I wonder where they're going. Who are they going to meet? What if something happens? Ha, ah, that's a big target for the devil. When you say, what if? He says, yeah, what if this really happens? And what if, and what if, and what if? This could be the last day that actually is seeing them this way again. No, no, this is not the last day. This is just the beginnings of many days that you're going to see them walk strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. But you're never with them. Exactly, I'm never with them. That's why I train them how to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. That's why I train them to know the word of God. That's why I train them to stand on the word of God. So that when they walk out, guess what? I say, Holy Spirit, put them into remembrance. Because one of the things that Jesus said that when I leave, I will ask the Father to send you a comforter. And when he comes, he will put you into remembrance of the things that I've taught you. So when they go and say, Holy Ghost, put them into remembrance wherever they go. When they try to get out or if someone is trying to, to blind them so that they do not see, put them into remembrance. And they'll say, oh, yeah, I need to do this. And you know what? We have seen that with our daughters. When there was some influence coming around, wherever they are, and they say, you know, this is what was happening. But we just remembered. You just did not remember. The Holy Spirit put you into remembrance. And you know what? They are a lot. And that's why when they were put into remembrance, they were able to lay hold of that and say, no, I'm not going to do that. You see, when you are alert and you are self-control, then you can see the power of God flowing through you. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to show you something over there. How the power of God will work through your lives. Ephesians chapter number 6. Ephesians chapter number 6, verses 10, Paul begins by saying, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. There again is the word, be strong. In other words, you do something with a strength, which means you already have the strength. Be some, be, be, do something with the strength that you have. You know, when you accepted Jesus as your Savior, there was an exchange of identity. In other words, the Holy Spirit inspired you with God. And therefore, you have the strength of God inside of you. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians 3.20 that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you think or is when speak according to the power that is at work in you. What power is at work in you? It is the power of the Holy Ghost. Because the Bible says in Romans 8.11 again, if the same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead dwells inside of you, the very same spirit will give life to your mortal body. In other words, that Holy Spirit is the power of God that is at work in you. He is a person and he has the strength of God inside of you. And therefore, we're being told, be strong in the Lord. In other words, delight yourself in him. Let your time of fellowship with him strengthen you. I think one translation says, be supernaturally infused through your supernatural strength in Christ. You know, if you're going to be infused, like to drink tea, and I get hot water, and you take that bag of tea, and when you put it in there, all you see is clear water. But when you allow that tea bag to sit there for a long time, it's going to infuse into that water and that clear water is no longer clear anymore. It has taken the color of the tea bag. 
So you're being told, be supernaturally infused. In other words, understand that you are a child of God and fellowship with God. Worship the Lord. Understand that he is your father. Begin to declare, I am born of God. And if I'm born of God, I overcome the world. If God be for me, who can dare be against me? Nothing can separate me from the love of God. If he gave us his own son, how much more does he want us to get everything that his son has already died for us for? If you understand those kind of things, you're being supernaturally infused. You are taking taking forth his identity inside of you. And if you're strong in the Lord, then you can see his power flow through you. If you're not strong in the Lord, you cannot see his power flow through you. Therefore, in your fellowship with him, now you can see his power flow through you. The mighty hand of God flowing through you. So Paul is saying, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Then he goes on to say this in verses 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. In other words, you're being told, put on the whole armor of God. In other words, there is some armor that is available for you. And this armor, if you know what it is, and you know how to put it on, then you can be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, which means the devil is trying to come against you, and you have to come against him. And the way you'll be able to come against him is as a result of the armor that you're putting on. Now, so many times, people don't know what the armor is. Or sometimes, people know what the armor is and they choose one and they leave the rest. And this armor is not a physical thing. See, some people say, I put on the shoes. Okay, we're going to read it through over here. Let's just read it through, then I go through because I'm going to run ahead of myself. Verses 12, he says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil days, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having guarded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having showed your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and taking the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So here Paul mentions what these armors are. And he goes on to say that the first one is... Uh, Guarding your waist with truth. So the first armor here is truth. And so you'll see some people say that, you know what, I need my belt. So I wake up in the morning, I have to put on my belt and so that I can be ready to go. Now, if you're putting on your belt in the morning when you wake up, which means when you're sleeping at night, you had no belt of truth. So all night you are exposed to the devil. And when you wake up in the morning, you pick it up and put it back on. And then they said the breastplate of righteousness. And I put it on in the morning when I wake up. So what happened when you're going to bed last night? <laughs> then my helmet of salvation. I put it on in the morning. What happened when you're going to bed last night? You are not saved? And when you wake up in the morning, that's when you're saved. Now I put it back on, I'm saved. No, it is not a physical armor that you put on. You have to understand that you, when you are born again, you know that you are a child of God. And knowing that you're a child of God, that helps your mind to know that I am a child of God. If someone comes and says, you're not a child of God, like, no, I am born again. Why? I have my helmet of salvation. When did you put it on? The day I accepted Jesus as my Savior. Amen. When are you going to put it off? Never. Amen. And so I am a believer. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. What about the belt of truth? I keep on building on the truth. Because Jesus says, if you continue in my word, you will know the truth. And when you know the truth and act upon it, it will set you free. So in other words, as a child of God, now I am constantly building on the truth. And as I keep on building on the truth, the truth that I build upon and act upon sets me free. And when you know the truth and act upon it, then there is nobody who can keep you away from freedom. But if you don't know the truth, have you ever heard people who say we are fighting for our freedom? Believers who are fighting for their freedom? What freedom are you fighting for? 
Because Jesus already went on the cross for you to be free. Because him whom the Son sets free is free indeed. That now you're being told, stand firm in the liberty wherewith you've been set free by the Lord Jesus Christ. So you find a believer say, we are going to pray today. We are going to storm the devil's den so that you can be free. You're wasting your breath, wasting your time. Because you've already been set free. Why do you want to storm the devil's den anyway? What are you doing there? What are you doing there? See, lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, you're going to be destroyed. The Bible says, my people are destroyed or my people perish for lack of knowledge. They do not know. And therefore, they think when we go in there and we storm it, today we are in the devil's den. Oh, and you think you're stepping on his head when you're jumping around. I'm stepping, I'm smashing you. <laughs> and he's standing somewhere looking at you and laughing and saying, oh my goodness, they don't even know what this is all about. And keep them thinking that this is what it is. And so every day they're going to do that. And the devil says that, oh, they don't know who we really are. If they knew who we really are, they won't be spending that much time like that. And therefore, you know the truth, you act upon the truth. Your breastplate of righteousness is your position in Christ. The Bible says, him who knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. In other words, I have been made right with God. Without any sense of guilt, shame, or condemnation. I stand before God without any sense of shame, guilt, or condemnation. I've been made right as a result of what Jesus did. And if you know that that is who you are, you never allow the enemy to bring you down from where you are. If you've been made right with God, you're right with God. What if I did something and I fell down? Stay still where you are. Don't come down to that position because when you come down from that position, guess what? The enemy has already devoured you and that is what he's looking forward to, bringing you down from your place of authority, from your place of power so you can come down and when you come down, guess what? The power of God will never flow from you because now you'll be in condemnation. But the Bible said there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Therefore, even if I I fall, I'm going to be falling from up and I keep on getting up while I'm up, not when I'm down. Amen. Amen. And so, I declare I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I will not be bold to say that. The devil is bold to make sure you fall down. So why do you want to be a wimp to say, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? And you want to allow the devil to cause you to be bold enough to say, I'm a sinner? No, I am not a sinner, and I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and I will not apologize for that. I will not apologize for that. So you stand in your position, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Wherever you go, let the word of God lead and guide you. Your feet showed with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The Bible says that the word of God is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Lord, lead me and guide me. Let your word be a lamp unto my feet. Let it be a light unto my feet. Wherever I go, help me out. And you know what? God is going to help you out on that. Then take your shield of faith. And your shield of faith, quench every fiery darts of the wicked one. Anything that the devil throws at you, you throw back the shield of faith. You are sick. I've been healed by the stripe of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are sick. I've been healed by the stripe of Jesus Christ. You are sick. I've been healed by the strap of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is happening? My shield of faith is quenching every fiery dust that the enemy is throwing against me. And therefore, any weapon formed against you shall not prosper. Why? Because I choose to stand. And I'm having made up my mind to stand, I stand therefore. Amen. I'm not going to go back and forth because if you go back and forth, then the enemy says, you are my target. Yeah. And when you're my target, I'm going to make sure that I steal from you. I destroy you, and I kill you. Yep. So I stand my ground, I stand my position. And you take the sword of the Spirit. And you take the sword of the Spirit, that will help you through very many avenues. Because the Bible said that the Word of God is quick and powerful. It is sharper than any two-double-edged sword. This Word of God is able to discern the intents that are in the hearts of men. It's able to expose what's going on in the hearts of men. And I stand on the Word of God, and when I stand on the Word of God, somebody might come to you looking really nice and being very emotionally moving. And you know what? In my heart, the Word of God says, mm, be careful for what you hear. 
And so when someone is trying to deceive you inside of me, the Holy Spirit puts up an alert and I say, you know what? No, thank you. I have inside information. You'll be amazed to see how many people are being deceived even, even though they are believers. They, they hear the voice of the Spirit. They ignore what the Holy Spirit is telling them. I come across so many people. They'll tell me, look, I, I knew in my heart something was wrong, but I did it anyway. You are ignoring your guide that has been given to you. And God has set up this that, you know what, don't allow the enemy to devour you. He goes around looking for whom he may devour. He wants to deceive you. And you know what? Number one thing that the enemy will use is emotions. Emotions. He, if you can fall for emotions, he has gotten you. But you know what? God doesn't deal in the emotional arena. God deals in the spiritual arena. And that's why you have to be alert spiritually. And when you're alert spiritually, then guess what? Emotions can't get you because the spirit will give strength to your body. The spirit will help you overcome the emotions that are there. And therefore, you stand strong in the word of God. And then you pray. Pray, pray, pray. Your prayer is not to get things. Your prayer is to fellowship with God. And as you're fellowshipping with God, he says, if you seek for the kingdom of heaven and all its righteousness, all these things will be added unto you. And if you're like me, I was told that the only time you pray is to get things. And so my life as a believer was started by praying for things. God, I need, 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 amen. God, I need, God, I need, God, I need, amen. So every day I wake up looking for something that I need because that's what I was taught. Prayer is I need. And God will answer your needs. And then I get some and I miss some. And so I say, how come I don't get? Because the person who was training me told me that I get everything that I need. And I say, I don't get everything. He says, sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. But just keep on praying. One day you're going to get everything. But thank God when you stay with the truth, he begins to open your eyes and say, actually, this is a fellowship you're having with me. And if you seek me first and put the kingdom of heaven first and you are concerned about my heart's desire, everything else you need will actually be added unto you. That's why we were singing today. Your goodness is running after me. I'm not running after God's goodness. Like, oh my goodness, it is five miles away. God, give me strength to catch your goodness. <laughs> No, it's running after me. Why? Because I'm busy doing what God wants to be done. And guess what? All these are overtaking me. Because God says, for I know the things that you're in need of even before you ask. And so when you delight yourself in me, I'll give you the desires of your heart. And so I don't let the enemy cheat me in my prayer. And now I begin to ask, I need, I need, I need, I need, I need. I stay with God. Amen. Amen. And therefore we are standing strong. So going back to the beginning of this, he says, put on the whole, uh, he said, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Wiles is simply schemes or strategy. So the enemy has got strategies. You don't have to be afraid of what the enemy will do. You just need to be equipped in your place with God. If you stand in your place with God, you'll overcome every trap of the enemy. And so we are told, don't be ignorant of the schemes of the devil. One of the places is unforgiveness. If any time you don't want to forgive somebody, you are holding onto the trap of the enemy. And when you hold onto the trap of the enemy, you've gotten into the ring with the enemy, and it is his own ring, not your, not, not your ring. And if you're in his ring, guess what? He fights and he wins. Yeah. But if he comes to your ring, you win. Because now he has come to invade you. And God is going to release every power within you to help you overcome. Amen? Amen? And so you have to be able to stand and overcome everything that the enemy has given to you. So what do you do in these last days? Stay alert. Be self-controlled. Be sober. Don't allow the enemy to be able to overcome you by suggesting things in your mind. By enabling you to fall for the things that will cause you to be able to be harmed, destroyed, or stolen from by the devil. And when you do that, you'll stand firm and you'll stand strong. And so I'd like to finish by giving this story. After I was born again, I was raised up in an environment where magic was real and witchcraft was real. And so there were witches who will declare to you 
what will happen and it will happen. And they'll throw some things on the road and say, if you pass over this or if you step over this, this is going to happen to you. And it happened. They had power. They had forces. But something happened to me when I was born again. I did not know it then that the Spirit of God was the influence in my heart that made me rise up against that. But still my mind was questioning that power with the power that is at work in me. And so I asked God one day, if you're really true the way you say you're true, then how come those witches are as strong as they are? I did not know much of the Bible. I was just born again. I'd only read Genesis chapter 1. That's all I'd read, and that's all I knew. And so God will lead you and guide you and instruct you according to what you know. So he told me, when I created man, I gave him power over all things, the birds of the air, the plants and the animals of the land, and the fish of the sea. And he says, I gave this authority to man, to the living things. And therefore, the witchcraft, they are using dead things. You have authority of the living. Why are you afraid of the dead? And so that changed my mind and said, oh yeah, they are using dust. They are using tails of rabbits, skins of leopard, jaw bones of animals. And that is paralyzing people and even causing people to be in danger. So, there's a one time a witch decided to cast a spell on me and say, I'm not going to make it. But I had inside information and I was not afraid. And so, I remember my mom telling me that you better not go that way because he has already pointed his finger at you. That if you're going to go that way, you will die. And he had spread some ashes over there. And he had put some things over there and some eggs. And he says, if you step on that, that's the end of you. Well, I couldn't blame my mom because she was not born again. But I was born again. Because God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you think or speak according to the power that is at work in you. Not what my mom thinks and speaks. What I think and speak according to the power that is at work in me. And so I made that decision and said, you know what? Wherever uh, I'm going to go, the Spirit of God is going to be with me. And so I stepped upon that path. And the eyes were looking at me, waiting for the outcome of it. <laughs> and then I walked back again on that, waiting for the outcome of it. And that outcome never worked. Why? Because I knew something that they never knew. I had a higher power than they did have. But I had to overcome the fear that was over there by the truth that I knew, and act on that truth. And when I acted on the truth that I knew, being led by the Spirit of God, because never act on the truth apart from the Spirit of God. Some people take the truth, even though the Holy Spirit is guiding them, they overrule the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I had one particular time, Keith Moore was saying that when he was over at Ramah in the prayer and healing uh, school, and a lady called and said she does not understand why she was mugged and robbed of her purse. So Kitmo was going to pray for her, but before Kitmo prayed for her, he was checking in his heart and said, God, uh, help me out in this. And God said, ask her what happened before she stepped out of the house. And she said, before I stepped out, I said Psalms 91. And then what, what happened? In my heart, I sensed that I didn't, I don't, I didn't need to go. But I said Psalms 91 anyway because the Bible says God gives his angel charge over us. But then Kitmo said, that, but the spirit was trying to lead you and guide you that don't go. There was something, even though that was the truth, God is going to give his angels charge over you. But he was trying to warn you of something and you never paid attention to that. So if you're going to stand on the truth, yield to the spirit of God. What's going on in your heart? What are you sensing in your heart? Is there a peace? To go along or is there like, no, no, let's think about this. And being led by the Spirit standing on the truth, you will be able to find the victory that God has already given to you. And to tell you the end of that story, the witch ended up dying. 
Why? Because they were coming against the anointing of God. They're not coming against me. It was against the anointing of God. Because as long as you're walking with God, doing the will of God, I don't care how many witches stand up against you, they'll never make it. And so you choose to stand on the word of God. And so this morning, I'd like to encourage you. Jesus Christ shed his blood for you. His body was broken for you. And he gave you the privilege to be able to stand strong and be bold. And this morning, I've encouraged you. You need to be sober. You need to be alert. Be on the lookout and don't let the enemy try to trick you into bondage again. You've been set free. Don't worry about the things that are going to take place. Be much more concerned of what the word of God says more than what's going to take place. Because God knows the end before the beginning. And therefore, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, be sober. Be vigilant. Resist the devil. Stand on the word of truth. Let the word of truth be your anchor. Let the word of truth be your protection. Let the word of truth be your strength. And as you stand on that word of truth, guess what? You'll walk free from everything that the devil is throwing at other people that will not come at you because you've chosen to stand on the word of God. Amen? Amen. And so today I'd like for us to receive communion. And while we are receiving communion, I would like to remind us what this actually puts us into remembrance of. It puts us into remembrance of what Jesus did for us. Because of the sin of man, man could never approach God. But because of Jesus' blood being shed for us, now we can stand before God as if sin has never existed before. Through one man's obedience, now we can stand before God. And therefore Jesus said on the night that he was being betrayed that as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Remember what the Lord Jesus did for you. He shed his blood for you. And this blood is a new covenant. And this new covenant has got better promises. We can stand before God free from guilt, free from shame, and free from condemnation. I don't care what you've gone through in life. You all have to understand that the blood of Jesus flows deep and cleanses your mind. Sets you free from every guilt. Sets you free from every shame. Sets you free from every condemnation. Also remember that Jesus' body was wounded. That you must be made whole. I don't care how much you may have pain in your body. As often as you do this in remembrance of him. You are receiving the life of God coming into your body. And he said as often as you do this. Do it in remembrance of me. So this morning I want us to do this in remembrance of him. If you can take the bread together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love that you have demonstrated towards us through your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, you took it upon yourself to go onto the cross and you were wounded for our transgression. You were bruised for our iniquities. The punishment of our peace was upon you. And with your stripes, we are healed. And so as we partake of this, Lord, we thank you for healing that is flowing through our bodies. We call ourselves healed. We call our organs healed. We call our bodies healed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Shall we partake of the bread together? Thank you, Father. We thank you and we praise you. We are forever grateful, Jesus, for the blood that is shed for us. For we understand that there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of the blood. And you shed your blood and that has cleansed us from every evil work. Now we are free from sin. And the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is working in us, causing us to walk in health and in healing, free from guilt and condemnation. And as we partake of this, We are forever grateful for the redemption work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Shall we partake of it together? Hallelujah. Father, we thank you and we praise you and we bless your holy name. We are forever grateful for what you have done for us through Christ Jesus. 
And Lord, having your identity, we can rejoice knowing that that which you began in our lives, you'll bring it to accomplishment. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Can you please stand with me? Hallelujah. Say this with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I am forever thankful for your faithfulness towards me. You always lead me and you always guide me in the path of righteousness. I walk in the light for I'm a child of light. Your light shines brighter in me, day by day, my spirit man is renewed, day by day, I walk in the light, I walk in the life of God, for your life strengthens me, your life makes me whole, I receive your life every single day, and I walk in your life, I walk in health and healing, I walk in prosperity. I walk in joy. I walk in peace. In Jesus' name. Your joy is my strength. I am a lot. I am self controlled. I am gentle. I am kind. I am love. And I'm joyous. In Jesus' name. I am a lot. I watch. As the Holy Spirit leads me, as the Holy Spirit guides me, I take my steps, for there are steps that have been ordered of you, and I overcome, because I'm your child. Thank you for loving me, thank you for leading me, thank you for healing me, and thank you for being my strength, in Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. We give God all the glory and all the praise. Thank you so very much for giving me an opportunity to share with you today. I'd like to encourage you to stay strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Walk in the newness of who you are by renewing your mind constantly to the Word of God. And remain to be more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. Amen. Stay blessed and have a wonderful rest of the week.